uh, evening. I'm Klaus Zeng, and uh, before starting uh, my lecture, I want to say thank you for inviting me here and uh, to Bochdown and also for you to, to Yuri for all the help the last couple of days, and also for all the participants in the course who made it a very nice and pleasant uh, stay here. Um, I'm uh, but the, the <coughs> title I gave to my lecture is uh, the fab time and the thin time because actually I want to focus on a little bit on time and on, on my way of <coughs> using and dealing with time but before uh, starting the le proper lecture I want to say a few more general sentences about also somehow the, this kind of course and about um, some very general things, composition. Um, I was uh, very much impressed uh, when I, some years ago, read uh, the very famous novel War and Peace by Tolstoy. And not everybody knows it, of course. And <coughs> it was very interesting because he, uh, of course, the, the most important part of the book is uh, about the Napoleonic Wars, about Napoleon conquering uh, Europe and trying to <coughs> conquer Russia. And it was very interesting because uh, Tolstoy is explaining his view of history. And in his view of history, uh, he says, um, very sim simplified, that basically it's not, uh, history is not made by the genius single person like for instance Napoleon or these great uh, single uh, persons who are enlightened and who lead the masses but his uh, opinion is as far as I understand just the opposite he says that Napoleon was not the one who was kind of leading the armies but the masses and the revolution was like a wave, like the sea, and Napoleon was kind of like a surfer who was propelled forward through the masses of, um, of uh, the population, and somehow that he was just someone who um, was put in front of the movement of time in general, and he was not the, the person to um, somehow um, force his will upon the, the hi history. And I think it's <coughs> this is a very interesting view on history and I, don't, and I think it also applies to not just to history uh, in general but also and especially also to history of art and history of music. <coughs> when we look back at the history of music we all have this grand names like Palestrina, Bach, Mozart, whatever. And so, and, and the way we are usually taught this, we, we see these heroic single figures, these titans that somehow invent everything. But basically in the history of music and in the music, it's always that these people were not isolated figures that just fall from sky, but they were always part of a much larger movement. Bach wasn't the only person who composed fugues in the 18th century, <coughs> but he was just one prominent member of the larger community of composers who were working on basically the same thing. And if you look at the works of great composers, it's hard to find something that they have invented themselves. But it's usually, you see, aha, uh -huh, this is taken from this composer, <laughs> this is taken from another composer, and so their function, <laughs> as far as I see, it's just like they, they are more representatives of a generation of, of co-workers that are working on one project together, and it's not so much this kind of heroic genius titan who invents everything by himself. <laughs> and I think, this is also some um, um, interesting and important spirit in, in uh, situations like master classes or university studies or whatever. That it's, it's actually not that we are trying to find the genius one person, but actually we all try to, to achieve something together. We are working on the project, on the question, what is music today? How can we compose music today that is part of our time and our <coughs> century. And it's not about the single person who invents something, but it's more like 
what the the um, showing what the, this community of people is trying to <coughs> put forward. And I, I uh, wanted to emphasize this thought also because we are in the last 20 or 30 years we are living in a time where every, everything is kind of only measured in uh, terms of uh, concurrency of market, the survival of the fittest, this kind of very primitive Darwinism. And ev every uh, part of our lives is kind of governed by this, this very simplified way of thinking about the world and about uh, <coughs> living together. And for me, as a composer, to the, the thought that I compose because I want to compose better than somebody else is totally absurd. And it doesn't have anything to do with my approach to art and to composition. And I think it's uh, especially also in, in, in this kind of university situations very important and also very precious to see that we don't have to follow this kind of ideology of, of market and of, uh, of concurrency, but that we can also see us as a community of people who are trying to achieve something in uh, with not trying to fight each other or not in a situation of concurrency but in a situation of, co uh, of mutual help and solidarity and, and some uh, idea of trying to achieve something uh, together uh, and I think that um, I felt in, in, in the last two days here that this is also what I hope also that some the participants of this course uh, uh, think and I just wanted to say this because uh, I think it's very for me this is a very important part of, uh, of also the compositional process to think uh, of it as something that is that we are not this kind of isolated little things but that we are in a, in a larger network of people who are trying to <coughs> find uh, answers to similar questions. Now, um, the title of my proper lecture, which is about to start now, is The Fat Time and the Thin Time. <laughs> and of course, I'm a composer. So, um, when I'm now talking about what I think and about my um, inspirations or about the things that influenced me, it's I, I, it's not important that what I say is right or wrong or it's philosophically correct or historically, but this is just my, my means that help me to compose. So it's not, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not the, the uh, I, don't, I don't need to be correct, so to say the only thing that counts is, is the, the work that stems from these thoughts. Um, but as I'm a composer, I um, want to um, start with just playing some parts of my music before I start to talk about it. And as I'm, the, the idea of the lecture is that I start to play some music, then I will uh, have a little bit of more abstract uh, thoughts, and then I will explain some details of my work with examples of uh, of music. So, but as the title of the lecture and my one of the most important uh, topics for me is time, uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of music that has some larger time proportions, not just two minutes or three minutes, but really um, some ten minutes of music, because time is, as I said, a very important part of my music. <coughs> so, I start uh, to play a little extract from a piece called Viola Harmonium uh, Orchestra and the title is uh, also the instrumentation so it's a piece for a large orchestra which is actually in the whole space this is something we want to be able to perceive now and a duo of uh, Viola d'Amore and Harmonium as a kind of not really soloist but a uh, second uh, somehow uh, uh, tiny ensemble. 
Um, this is the piece is 55 minutes, so I'm just going to play uh, a fade in and fade out uh, 10 minutes uh, around 10 minute section of the piece. And um, as some people really like high frequencies, I start with a section that is in a very high register. <coughs>
world section of the piece. It contains a lot of things that I will be talking about later. Uh, that's why I, uh, this is also one reason for <coughs> choosing the piece. Um, what you can see here on the screen behind me is a painting by Francisco de Surbaran, a great Spanish painter of the 16th, 17th century. And uh, you can easily see it's a still life. And this is a very old uh, paint, uh, tradition of painting, still life landscape paintings. And the interesting thing for me is that painters who belong to this tradition of paintings um, they try to confine themselves to represent the given. There is just these five uh, um, pots that he found in the kitchen or somewhere and arranged in, in this way and um, painted them. So they are not eager to create new realities, but they aim at thoroughly seeing what is to be seen without trying to interpret it or to uh, add any additional meaning. They try, so to say, to see piercingly to the heart of uh, reality as it is. And Surbaran's paintings, they give you the impression that they are depicting a particular event only as an excuse to paint um, daily life objects. The objects are like these pots or clothing or whatever, um, very um, somehow uh, profane and, and simple objects and <coughs> when you look at um, just one second the next for instance like this or like this it's not it's very small but um, you can see it's, it's white monks and, and they are sitting in the refectory of the monastery and like this, so you, you think that he's actually not painting these things, the, the story, in, um, because um, he wants to tell the story, but it's maybe just the opposite. He has this story just because he wants to paint the objects. And um, so the, the saint or the monk that he's painting is actually not really interesting to him. What is really interesting for him is the texture of this cloth texture of the material that he is looking at. Um, so the interesting thing is that somehow through this artistic power of, of Subaran, these totally profane and uh, everyday pro objects, they turn into something completely different. They turn into something almost uh, sublime. And the interesting thing, thing is that, so to say, the, um, that what makes uh, the paintings by Subaran works of sacred art is not so much that they are telling a story <laughs> about the saint, saint or uh, monks or whatever, but because of this particular quality of his uh, paintings, of this, uh, so to say, transcending power of, of his uh, uh, artistic uh, potence. Um, and another painter, <coughs> uh, I would like to refer to is also someone who is famous for painting uh, pots and um, everyday objects. It's the Italian, uh, great Italian 20th century painter Giorgio Morandi. Oh, sorry, it's very small. Maybe you know him. He, Giorgio Morandi, spent his whole life actually in Bologna. And he lived in a small <coughs> apartment, and uh, he went to jumble sales or to flea markets and bought these strange pots and really like almost trash objects. And then he arranged them in his little apartment and actually spent his whole life just painting these objects and uh, arranging the light a little bit different and looking at all at these very simple objects. Uh, in very um, in different ways. So there's actually nothing interesting, nothing is hidden behind. There is no deep significance, there is no met metaphorical meaning, no symbolical meaning. It's just pots and balls in a very uh, uh, 
simple way. But the interesting thing is, thing is especially if you look at, this, at the ori original paintings, what kind of, uh, so to say, sober intensity these paintings have. The paintings are uh, filled with a very strong power, even though they are actually saying they, they don't have any meanings above showing these thoughts. Another painter I would like to mention is, uh, okay, it's getting smaller and smaller, is Piet Mondrian. Everybody, I guess, knows Piet Mondrian. He was a Dutch painter who lived in uh, Holland. Uh, only at the very end of his life, he moved to New York, and he's famous for for inventing this kind of uh, paintings. And the, what what is interesting about them is that I assume that since there are human beings on this planet, they have known black lines, and they have known rectangles, and they have seen uh, primary colors. So nothing what you see in this painting is something that Mondrian invented or found. I mean, everybody has or seen before <laughs> Mondrian a black line. But nevertheless, he managed to find a way to, to, to use these totally basic and banal materials to create an artistic form that turned the perception of these black lines and rectangles and primary columns into a completely new experience. Nobody has, before Mondrian has seen black lines in this way, even though millions of people <laughs> have seen black lines before him. And so what, what he managed to do was to see the most simple and best known things as something fresh and new. And he shared this vision, this new vision, and unique view with us in his art. And for me, this is exactly <coughs> what I think that defines great art and great artists. And, and it's also a, a similarity with the world of science and scientists. A new scientific discovery is also nothing else but a new vista on an already known phenomenon, a new way to see the same things. I mean, we have all seen the planets, we have all seen the sun, millions and millions of people have seen it, but it's just a question, how do we explain them? How do we interpret them? And this is changing throughout the history. And, uh, and I think the same applies <coughs> to art. As I said, we have all seen these squares and all seen these lines, but not in this particular, in this special way. <coughs> and so um, this is for me, uh, as I said, one of the most important things about <coughs> art and about um, achievements in art, that they, great artists make us see the world differently, that they open up a different uh, view on the things that we have already, we thought we would, already, would, would have known. And now, I think there is no, so to say, prescribed method or preferred material to find a new way of seeing. Any approach, any, attri uh, any tradition of music or thought from, from wherever can be useful and helpful to broaden our view, to find new uh, approaches and new vistas on uh, the reality as it is before us. Um, so, we could say that um, if we see this in a, in a, on a more abstract level, that um, what, what, they are, what these paint, painters are actually interested in is um, the act of perceiving, the act of seeing. And of course they are painters, so what they are seeing is space or, and maybe color. So the, the, the object of their art is not, so to say, not the, the rec rectangle, but is the way we see this uh, rectangle, the way we perceive it. And this is, <coughs> the, so to say, uh, the, this, this um, seeing, uh, this experiencing of this light that is somehow reflected from this um, uh, canvas is actually what is a, the, the center of their artistic <coughs> interest. When we think about 
music. We could say as an um, analogy that the experience of time experienced through listening is the actual object of music. And it is not by chance that the title of one of the most important pieces of music of the 20th century is a duration, 4 minutes 33 seconds. And time as the actual material of the composer becomes in this piece of music the only theme of music. 4 minutes 33 seconds is music seen as pure duration. Sound is nothing else as uh, time made audible. The, the contingent content of this piece, of 4 minutes 33 seconds, of, mu of this mu musical piece is like in uh, still lives, the acoustic everyday objects. Uh, they are neither interpreted nor charged nor whatever, they are just presented as they are. <coughs> so for me this experience of time through listening is the root of, uh, of and the key to the very core of what music means to me or is for me. With this piece, <coughs> John Cage shatter, shatters the traditional notion of work of art in the sense that Cage defines a piece of art neither by its content, so every time you perform the piece, the content will be different because the surrounding, the sounds surrounding us will be different, uh, nor is it the creator of the piece of art that determines or even influences the character of the piece of music. But the only thing that remains untouched is the form. 4 minutes 33 seconds has a strict uh, fi fixed duration and it has a formal structure in three movements. So, um, yeah. When we <coughs> look at music in a, in a very sober and in a very empirical way, we could say what composers primarily do is organizing air, or precisely the movement of the oscillation of air molecules. And when we are inquiring thoroughly into the nature of sound waves, we will find very significant and very striking discontinuities in our perception. One phenomenon, uh, waves or oscillating molecules of air, is perceived by us as completely different impressions using dif even different senses. Oscillating air can be caught by our, by our ears and perceived as sound. Our skin can feel them as vibrations or as warmth. Um, even when we concentrate on the field of acoustics, we experience remarkable fractures in our perception. Sound waves are perceived as either periodic impulses and as pitch. Or, depending on the speed of this oscillation, we um, perceive the same periodic impulses as a rhythmical structure, as uh, not as uh, pitch but as rhythm. And what is the most fundamental difference between these phenomena it is, is only their temporality. It depends on time only, which sense organ is used for a specific oscillation and to which kind of perception this leads, to rhythm or to pitch. So we could say that when we use our ears to perceive something acoustically as sound, what we perceive is nothing else but time made audible. And this is actually where my understanding of music starts. Musical material is time perceived through sound. The object of music is the experience of time through listening. Uh, so in my, my own work, <coughs> I'm not using sound. Sound is explored and given the opportunity to unfold its inherent rich beauties. Music is not a means to convey extra musical contents, such as philosophical or religious ideas, uh, emotions, propaganda, advertisements, whatever. For me, music is not a language used to communicate non-musical contents, but for me, is, music is a free and self-standing acoustical object. 
Music is like a snowflake or like a cliff or a mountain or whatever.